So I've been reading this book called Breakdown of Wealth by psychiatrist George Ainsley. And this book centers around the idea of the will, which has traditionally been known in philosophy, uh, ancient Greeks, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, in an ascending order as that faculty that gets us to do the things that we need to do. And the opposite of that was known as agracia, which, or acracia, if you want to pronounce it that way, which could, which is probably the origin of the word procrastination. So acracia is basically just the weakness of the will. And in this book, George Easley, Dr. Easley tries to explain why people do things that are counterproductive or that are damaging. Basically bad habits, which don't really fit into the whole idea of economics. So he tries to use, he uses a lot of different material from philosophy, from psychology, and from economics. So from economics, from the economic viewpoint, for many decades, uh, utility theory was the basis um, from which uh, people saw the behaviors of individuals, the decisions they made. So in utility theory, the, there was this idea of economic men whose actions were always rational in the sense that he would always seek the decision or the choice that would bring him the most reward. So in that sense, you can think of it as money or as in other things that are of use to this individual. But it didn't explain traditional or conventional utility theory. The bad decisions that people make, the bad choices that people make, uh, the bad habits that people make, like a person who binge eats or eats a tub of ice cream or a person who smokes cigarettes or a person who is uh, who doesn't exercise and is just uh, very uh, uh, just doesn't exercise or doesn't do physical activity or people who uh, go into compulsions and have uh, which is the other extreme, a, a sort of a obsessive um, control or self-control, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, or people who have addictions to drugs, to alcohol. So utility theory doesn't explain that. And if you were to use utility theory, you would go about and say that people's choices are based on exponential curves, but Ainsley and his team of researchers came with the idea of hyperbolic curves, which are more about than exponential curves. Because if we were to use um, natural selection or uh, theories or theory of evolution for the choices that people make, um, then everybody would be perfect. There would be no room for bad habits and there really wouldn't be a need for will and battles for morals and virtues of the Renaissance in his own words and of other philosophers throughout the ages. So what does that mean? That we can use this theory to explain the bad habits, the addictions of people. He proposes that individuals are, have a marketplace uh, of different decisions, let's call them, that they have to choose from, and that each decision can produce a certain amount of reward 
in a certain period of time. So there can be short range rewards for certain choices. And there can be long range rewards for certain choices. And this hyperbolic discounting would explain why we usually tend to choose sometimes the shorter range rewards. Let's say you want to save up for a new computer, but instead you use that money and you spend it. Instead of saving a little bit every week, you decide to go every weekend and go to the bar and have a bunch of drinks with your friends. So you would have those two choices. One would provide you with uh, social interaction and maybe pleasure and enjoyment, distraction, relaxation from a long week of work. And the other one would provide you with, with a tool that would come at a later time. So that's kind of his idea in a nutshell. He calls it pico-economics or micro-micro-economics. And it explains sometimes why people go into addictions. Because if you use or traditional utility theory, it really wouldn't make much sense. The person would just uh, would say, well, it's not really beneficial for me to drink a bunch of alcohol and not work because I'm not going to be able to have the reward of money. And I'm not able to pay rent. I'm not going to be able to live. I'm not going to be able to do the things that I need to do. But with this hyperbolic discounting, discounting or interdeport bargaining, as he also calls as another term that he uses. And I'm just trying to summarize. It's a complex book. It explains why these people go into addictions because a lot of models have tried to explain it, but one, one way to explain it would be that these people go and seek those rewards which are provide sort of quick satisfaction, short range, but that provide, but also have negative consequences. But why? Because hyperbolic discounting curves. Hyperbolic curves. You can't really can we really blame individuals when we have all of this upbringing and this is a point apart and habits and problems and difficulties and pains. One example that he uses that I'm going to read verbatim when he explains pains is the following. So he, he provides this example which I thought was really uh, fascinating. So he proposes this scenario. So he, he says, let's say you just have the chance of reading an engaging story with a distraction. A nearby tape recorder plays an unrelated but even more engaging story in five minute episodes every 30 minutes. At these intervals, switching back and forth probably wouldn't be very annoying. But if the times gradually became shorter, for instance, one minute of tape recording for every six minutes of reading or five seconds for every 30, it would get to that the disruption of the story you were reading would make the otherwise enjoyable tape recording a nuisance. The recording would take on the properties of an itch. If the distraction were shorter still, say, a varied 
and highly stimulating pattern of words or sounds that you heard for one second, every six, or even 0 0.1 second, and every 0 0.6 second, the distraction will get more irritating and your sense of directing your attention voluntarily would get less. The brief distractions might totally dominate the intervals between them so that you no longer seem to have two sequential experiences, reading and distraction, but rather the single experience of reading with distraction or maybe being unable to read at all. So I want you to analyze that idea and how it's been utilized for a long time and how it's still being utilized and it's sort of uh, operating conditioning with positive punishment. If you understand what I'm saying, then maybe you can do something about it.